us here this morning, um, and also to those who are joining us in the comfort of your own home. It's great to have you with us, and we hope that you enjoy your time of fellowship with us this morning. Now, we were supposed to have Mr. Colin Miller to come and take the service, but unfortunately, Colin has contracted COVID, so Nigel has kindly agreed to fill in for Colin. Nigel's known to most of us so far. Nice to look forward to, to your message to us this morning. It's just a few announcements to make you aware of. Uh, on Tuesday from 10 to 12, they didn't matter will meet. And then on Thursday, uh, <clears throat> there's no prayer union in the hall this Thursday. It's the last Thursday in the month, which means that it's MWI night. And it's at eight, the MWI will meet at 8 o'clock in the hall. And the speaker this month is Mrs. Hazel Loney. And all ladies uh, are more than welcome to join them at 8 o'clock this Thursday night in the hall. Then on Friday morning, the prayer meeting and Bible study will continue at 10.30. And then at 7.30 on Friday evening, the bones will meet as usual. Then next Sunday, morning worship will be here as usual at 10.30. And the Reverend Ken Lindsay will be along to take the service next week. And you'll be glad to know that as from next week, you will be able to join in the hall afterwards for a cup of tea and coffee and time of fellowship after the service from next Sunday. So these are all the announcements you may remember them in prayer. Thank you Mark and apologies for your change of speaker. I got a phone call at half eight this morning as I was going out to the yard. So unfortunately the amount of preparation I've done for this morning has been somewhat limited. We trust we will enjoy a sense of the Lord's presence this morning as we worship together. Our opening hymn is Great is our faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not, as thou hast been, thy forever will be. Let's stand and sing.
O God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as a body of your people to worship you. Father, you indeed are worthy of all our worship, the bountiful donor of all we enjoy, our tongues to thine honour and lives we employ. Father, we praise you for your wonderful love and mercy to each one of us. It's so plentiful and you're constantly pouring it out upon us. So often, Lord, we get caught up in the mundane things of life and we forget you. Father, forgive us. Help us to constantly remember that you are the beginning and end of all things for those who love you. Help us to continually give you the praise and glory and may our lives be lived in your service. Lord, we would praise you that because of your wonderful divine love for us, your Son, the joy of heaven came down to earth to bring us your salvation. Lord, we would thank you that your Spirit is with us at all times, ministering to us of you, comforting us in times of sadness and celebrating in times of joy. Lord, when we consider our own, our own unworthiness, our own righteousness as filthy rags, we praise you that through the blood of Jesus, we are righteous in your sight. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we fall short of the standard you've set for us. Forgive us when we don't take the opportunities to live and to witness for you. Lord, we pray that each day we might grow more and more like you, that we might be more and more useful instruments in your hands. And as we come before you this morning, we, Lord, we would pray for, uh, for Philip and for Susan and for the boys. And we pray your hand upon them as they seek to guide and lead amongst us. Lord, for the sick amongst us this morning, we ask your blessing. For those in hospital, Lord, we pray for healing. For those who are about to undergo surgery, Lord, we pray that they might have the assurance of your guiding hand. And for those, Lord, who are maybe waiting for test results, we pray that we might not be over anxious but that you might have and supply the grace to endure what lies ahead. Lord, we pray for the elder who are not fit to be out with us this morning. We pray for your assurance that, for the, that they might have the assurance that they're not forgotten and they might know your peace. Lord, we pray for Colin and for his family and pray that the COVID that they have got might not be too severe and that they may recover quickly. And Lord, for those who have lost loved ones in recent times, we pray your hand of comfort that they may surround you, that you might be all that they need. Lord, for those who have come, become cold-hearted and have lost the desire to meet together, in fellowship, Lord, we pray that once again you might light the fire within their hearts that they may come back to you and be restored to fellowship once again. Particularly, Lord, at this time, we would think of the people of Ukraine. Lord, it's hard for us to imagine just the extent of the horror that they're facing, their homes destroyed around them. Families separated as wives and children flee to safety, leaving behind husbands and brothers and fathers to defend their country. Lord, we pray for your keeping hand upon them. We pray that the hands of evil men may be stayed and that once again peace may return to that area. Father, we praise you that you are always available to us. Whenever we reach out for your help, forgive us, Lord, that so often we only do that in times of crisis. 
and try to live at other times in our own strength. Lord, help us to learn and trust, to completely rely on you in all that we do, in business, in leisure and in worship, because we know that that is what you would wish for us. Bless us now, Lord, as we continue to offer you our praise and worship, because we do so in the name of the Sovereign Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to read from uh, the scriptures from the book of Genesis, and it's Genesis chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and the creatures of the that move along the ground and the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. And this is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. And make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. And put a door on the side of the ark and make lower and middle and upper decks. And I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. And we pray that God will add his blessing to this reading from his precious word. Amen. We're going to sing again, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. We'll stand and sing.
The story of Noah is one of the best known stories of the Bible uh, by those possibly also who have little interest in Christianity or in the things of God. Whenever Noah's name is mentioned, immediately everyone thinks of the ark. And you know the story well. God had made man and had placed him in the Garden of Eden with all the beauty and glory of a great God surrounding him. But that man sinned and brought all mankind down into sin with him. And the sin grew until it filled the hearts of all and we read, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And on searching throughout the world, God found one good man, Noah, a man who stood out amongst all the sinful men of his day, a man who lived a godly life in the midst of a sinful generation. So God commanded Noah to build the ark, giving him fairly specific instructions. And for 120 years, Noah and his family labored and when it was finished, he brought his family and the animals God had instructed him to bring into the ark. And at God's appointed time, the rain began to fall and soon the water flooded the whole earth. Those outside the provision God had Noah make perished. Those who obeyed were saved. And the salvation that came to Noah is an illustration of our salvation in Jesus Christ, who is our ark of safety. And I want to take a little time this morning to look at Noah, his life and his work. But firstly, the perversity of the people. The Bible tells us that the whole earth was filled with sin and we read, God saw. He always does. We can hide our evil from others, but not from God. He sees us not only in the brightness of the midday, but also in the darkness of the midnight. He saw Adam eating the forbidden fruit. He saw Jacob when he cheated others. He saw David when he committed the blackest of crimes. He sees us when we break his commandment and ignore his teachings. What did God see? He saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Where does sin begin? It begins in our thoughts. When we keep our thought life clean, we can keep sin out of our lives. Jesus said, Blessed is the pure in heart. These people in Noah's day were impure in their hearts, therefore their deeds were sinful. And as a result of individual corruption, the nation became full of violence. This is also true today. Individuals make up a town or a city or a nation. Why is there so much corruption? It's because individuals have no time for God. They have put aside his law, his commandments, and his teaching. It only takes a spark to start a raging forest fire. Sin is like that. It starts small. It takes hold and gradually it can take over if it's not dealt with quickly. And that's what happened in Noah's day. It grew and grew until it developed or enveloped an entire nation. And yet amongst all this sin we read, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of a black night of sin, one bright light was still shining. God not only sees the evil, but he also sees the good in us. And we can be thankful that he hath not dealt with us after our own sins, nor rewarded us according to our impurities, as it says in Psalm 103. Noah was an upright man, and often he must have felt very alone. 
Was it worth being different from everyone else? Was his life all in vain? But God had a job for Noah. His upright character was rewarded, not by man, but by God. And when the time for <coughs> came for God to move, he had his man. Often when the pendulum of life swings the wrong way, he has a man or a woman to swing it back. And when the clouds are blackest, he can send a ray of sunshine. When the people had gone as far as they could in their ways of sin, God had his man ready to correct the situation. God said, My spirit will not always strive with man forever. He'd had enough of their wickedness. They had had ample opportunity to repent, and yet they ignored him. And so he commanded Noah to build the ark. Noah believed God and followed his instructions. And sometimes some, such actions can seem costly when we must do them. You can imagine the local reaction. Old Noah's finally flipped. He's building a boat. Where is he going to sail it? There's going to be a flood. I don't suppose anybody told him that we don't get floods here. What size is it? Over 400 foot? You're having so on. When are the men in white coats going to come and take him away? But for 120 years, Noah and his family endured the score. But yet he was faithful. He believed God. Hebrews 10 tells us that by faith Noah built the ark. What is our faith like? Is it strong in the face of adversity? Noah not only believed God, but he was obedient to him. And he prepared the ark right down to the inch that God had directed. Today God warns us of judgment to come, but he also prepares for us a way of escape. By the way of the cross, where Jesus died for our sin. And yet people still don't want to go God's way. They want to go their own way. They expect to be maybe saved by good living, their gifts or their fine characters. But the word of God says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby me must be saved. He said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus shed that blood. In Ephesians 2, we read that for by grace are ye saved, through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Noah was happy that the Lord was going to save him. But he also wanted others to be saved. As Christians who know the Lord, that is our privilege too. Our privilege and responsibility to share the gospel with others in need of salvation. Second Peter 2 tells us that Noah became a preacher of righteousness. No doubt as he worked and discussed what he was doing with people, he pleaded to them to repent. But they scoffed and they mocked him. People today still mock those who warn of a coming judgment. Today, indifference is probably Satan's biggest weapon in keeping men and women from the kingdom. And Noah is a real example to us all in perseverance. We don't read of a single convert outside his own family from 120 years of work. But it's not up to us to judge God's work in numbers. Our responsibility is to sow the seed. Others may reap the harvest. Faithful preaching and personal witness, preaching of sin and repentance and salvation through faith in Christ, will always bring results. 
There are some who say the message needs updated for the modern world. Well, maybe the method of presentation does, but the message is still the same. Christ never changes. What he did for each of us at Calvary hasn't and won't change. That all have sinned and need salvation won't change. Modern man needs salvation just as much as any who have gone before. As Christ told Nicodemus, it is still true that everyone must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. The people of that day ignored the warnings of God's faithful preacher Noah. That was their privilege, but it also was their destruction. When a man is drowning and you throw him a rope, it's his privilege to ignore it, but he'll lose his life. If we throw you the rope of salvation and you push it aside, that's your privilege. But at the judgment seat of Christ, having attended church, having heard the invitation, will not be enough. If you don't accept his invitation, if you don't repent of your sin, if your name's not in the Lamb's Book of Life, the response will be, depart from me. For I never knew you. When the ark was finished, Noah and his family and the animals went inside. Then God himself shut the door. Noah must have been grieved that none of his neighbours could come in, but God had given them every opportunity to be saved, and now it was he who shut the door. We must do our best to present Christ to others and then leave the rest to God. In the ark was safety, life, food and fellowship. Outside was death and destruction and finally a horrible silence. So in Christ there is life abundant and life everlasting. Outside of him there is death and doom and hell. Noah was saved in only one way. There was no alternative. He believed God and obeyed him and entered the ark. We are saved in the same way. We believe, we obey and we enter into Christ by faith because that is the only way. In time the flood was over. And God's purpose had been fulfilled. And the waters receded from the face of the earth, and God set the ark gently down upon the mountain top. And he told Noah and all his charges to disembark. And what did Noah do as soon as he was out on dry land? He erected an altar and offered a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord. And the Lord God, smelling the sweet savour, was pleased. I can remember when I was young, on one of the landings at home, we had a very big old picture of that sacrifice. And it always impressed me. And it also reminds us of the Pilgrim Fathers travelling to America. Leaving a land of persecution, they endured many sufferings on the voyage and some died. But landing on the shores of a free land, they fell on their knees. They thank God for a safe voyage and a new life. All of life is a voyage through troublesome waters. But someday the voyage will be over and in glory we shall fall at his feet and praise him forever for bringing us safely home. Let us never forget to offer him our praise and our worship for he alone is worthy of our highest praise. Revelation 5 and 12 says, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, honour and glory and blessing. Following Noah's sacrifice, God made a wonderful promise. As long as the world remained, he would not destroy mankind again as he had done, and that seasons and days would not change. 
Then he gave mankind a lovely token to act as a sign that he will remember his promise, his covenant, and he set a rainbow in the sky. When you next see a rainbow, remember that our God keeps his promises. What he promises, he will accomplish. Just think for a moment of some of those promises. To save to the uttermost all who come to him in faith in the Lord Jesus. To answer prayer if we abide in him. To care for us if we trust in him. To comfort us when we are bereaved. To give us peace when our minds are stayed on him. He promises us overcoming power if we are surrendered to him. To be with us at the end of the way and take us over the river of death. And beyond death, he promises to take us home where nothing that mars or hurts us can ever touch us. Yes, God keeps his promises. And the story of Noah gives us a true picture of the condition of the world today. And as we think of the perversity of the people of Noah's day, we think of all the sin around us today. And when we think of Noah's purity, we think of the purity of our Saviour who was without spot or without blemish. And as we think of the 120 years of Noah's preparation, we think of how Christ's death on the cross prepared the only way of salvation for us. And as we think of his preaching, we think of all the faithful preachers who are calling people to repentance today. As we think of his preservation, we think of our ark of safety, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think of Noah's praise, we want to thank Jesus throughout all eternity for saving us. And as we think of his promises, we rejoice that he said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And that he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And bow our heads in prayer, let's pray. <coughs> our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Noah, who in spite of living in a perverse world, was still upright and obeyed you. Lord, we pray that we might take him as an example, that we might stand up for you, for all that is right, when it's so much easier to follow the crowd, people who feel that it's, if something is good for them or something that they enjoy, then they're right and they're entitled to it. Father, we know that you are a holy God. You have given us your instruction through your word. Lord, we pray that we might use that as our instruction manual for life, that continually we might be before you, seeking your will in our lives. Father, we bring you our praise that you have through what Christ has accomplished at Calvary, through the shedding of his blood, you have made us righteous in your sight if we come confessing our sin, believing in Christ, believing that you have raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand to intercede on our behalf. Lord, we come completely reliant on him and pray that you will continue to bless us as we go out on another week to live our lives for you and in your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we conclude our service with uh, the hymn, Guide me, O thy great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. And we'll stand and sing.
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.